So it's the last art lecture series talk of the year. Bittersweet and wonderful ending. Hooray for the art lecture series, right? Yes. Huzzah. Um, before we get started, the Practice of the Everyday, a program um, that Julia Zay and I have taught this past quarter, um, wrote somatics for C.A. Conrad, and Sean is going to present them. Yeah, although he's having a sandwich, so. <laughs> um, so, in advance, to, in advance, thanks to C.A. Conrad for coming and here are the somatics from the practice of oh, the other thank day. Oh, thank you. Wow, thank you. <laughs> so, um, David Wallach will be introducing C.A. this morning, but before. Um, we bring David up. Alice has an announcement. And here's Alice. Hi. So um, on this Friday, the 30th, thank you, um, at the New Moon Cafe, we're going to have another mutant radio poetry night, number three. And... Um, And uh, joining us will be C.A. Conrad and our own Jane Mary. Yeah. Oh! Julia Suazo. Oh! And a performance of the comic, But to the Future. So it's 9 p.m. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's 9 p.m. New Moon Cafe. Thank you, and I'll see you there, hopefully. <laughs> How are the nosebleeds? Hey, y'all. Um, thank you, Alice. Um, I, I seriously encourage everybody to go to Mutant, Mutant Poetry. Mutant uh, Poetry is awesome. Uh, I've been to a couple of the events that happened already. The readings are always great. Um, so do go, do join us at Friday night and hear a uh, reading from Conrad and others, uh, other excellent poets, um, some of whom go to this school, as far as I understand. Yes? Yes. Excellent. Um, I had one other quick announcement, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Conrad. And I wanted to, but before that, I just wanted to say thanks to you all for coming. Um, thanks for participating programs, um, for participating, uh, not just with bodies, obviously, but uh, doing that heavy, heavy lifting, um, along with Shaw Osha, the curator this year of the artist's lecture. I want to give a make big shout out to, to Shaw for the work that she does, uh, uh, threading this stuff together. And, and certainly to, to Conrad. Um, quick announcement. Um, how many of you all know about the rally uh, or, or di uh, discussion, as the, uh, is the case I think it is, it is uh, that is happening with regard to Quisney or what's going on with Quisney? Show of hands. Um, talk, I was talking to Conrad about this earlier. Um, Elizabeth Williamson and I were. And um, there's an important group uh, discussion happening on Red Square today in relation to um, uh, a production by uh, some really courageous and artistically creative, some wonderful, wonderfully creative um, Evergreen students who happen to be queer or put, who are queering um, Disney in ways that, as far as I understand it, are, are legal. Um, and I bring that up because uh, the college so far has, has decided that they're gonna try and um, stop this production from happening because uh, of the quote unquote worry that it breaks copyright law in some way. And that way has not been specified. So we're gonna, we're gonna discuss Quisney, the implications of, of, of the potential barring of this event um, and Quisney related stuff. There's gonna be a performance I know uh, potentially um, after the discussion. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, look, it's not just about queer rights, it's not just about one production group's rights. It's about all of us in this room um, and our ability to express through um, citation of lyrics, through appropriation, creative appropriation, which is responsible citation, um, uh, in ways that, that we feel um, will, will, uh, will be artistically beneficial to us and to others. 
So, um, so please come out to that. Um, it's right after this, this artist talk by Conrad. Isn't it weird though? I mean, can we just stay on that topic a second? Please. I mean, it's just very funny that, um, I'm not even introduced yet, but I'm talking, sorry. As always. I mean, gays are allowing the military now to put rainbow stickers on machine guns and kill Arabs with impunity. I don't understand di why Disney would be. Like, it's already too late for Disney to be upset anyway, right? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, they've been it's all wrong now. Everything's wrong now. Lots of case law on this already, right? Yeah. And, and as far as we know, the matter um, uh, was often much more gray than this one is today. And those cases won against Disney. Well, what an impossible task, Conrad, and thank you for, for that. Um, and just, that was an explication of how Conrad makes things possible and pos impossible at the same time in a wonderful way. Um, an honor, but impossible. I'm so glad um, to be reading instead of looking at you. Hold on a second. <laughs> I, too nervous. I, I have to read to you. I'm sorry. Um, so it's just an introduction, but I feel, feel an impossibility here. Um, but maybe it's just a hard thing to be good, or at least to make a gesture good in the sense of ethically so as what to introduce another human creature, one for you perhaps a little something, you know, something a little, bit, a little bit about, but certainly for whom you want others to know something a little bit about, desires us and desires of us. So to make a gesture good, an introduction of a friend to others good, or a poet to other poets, which is at least in terms of the introduction, since that is after all just the beginning of things, thus in some small, perhaps vividly insufficient way to be careful and to be generous and loving, to be there and present in collaborative vulnerability, in loving thanks and hello, and here we are, in strangeness, in hues of outness, and in the queerest of understandings. So maybe that's hard. It is far harder, perhaps, to sustain one's care, to in fact, love strangers, let alone one's friends, to love in some ways all strange language as well as all strange fruit. If so, it is hard to do the caregiving work that makes for a gesture so small as simple as introduction when CA's friendship and collaboration and CA's poetry are rituals and sustained love and how they love strangely and love hard. It is then that for introductions when Conrad's care, indeed at times his caregiving, in the darkest, never mind the most joyous times, has been so deep, been so much and so been, been, so, been gifted so lastingly to so many of us. It is hard to introduce even a sliver of what Conrad has given us over to, uh, over to us so lovingly in the poetry. Strangers and friends, friends now here in and with such strangeness. What Conrad has given in poems, in book like the Book of Frank, or his most recent to date, A Beautiful Marsupial Afternoon. Get it. In his now famous, if too fleeting, bathtub reading series, Google it. In his Reiki practices, in his radical political gestures, in his insistence that if we do anything, we consider the poetry in politics, the urgency in poetry, and that we therefore consider the urgency in and around us, that we be present with and for one another, and consider the necessity of taking and giving sustained care, which is a kind of coming to be and also to become with and for one another and our world. To orient ourselves to those things and crucially to orient ourselves to those human creatures, as Conrad put it the other night to me, so that, quote, we, can, we, can't, that we, that we can't see, but that are right in front of us. We have been who have been trained or socialized to not see or to avoid or to misunderstand and to invisibilize. It is in coming to know this in Conrad's poetry, this insistence in resistance that Conrad's poetry is, among other things, a sustained love letter to those who are or even have been invisible.
in that cry, in these beautiful poems, in the rituals that come to help Conrad make many of them, there is the insistence of our relation to one another. In such a relation, the, it, the urgency is the loving hard and of understanding differently, not least so that we may take care not to oppress or subject the other to the merely curious and thus normative gaze, or that moment of ardently unthoughtful judgment, or that fearful reaction to another that responds to muzzle our own potentially ecstatic encounters, our moment of alteration when confronted with the onset of another's wildest and queerest modes of expression. It is in our open vulnerability and our acts of creative expression that we find the courage finally to speak, to speak out, to sing maybe, and sing out, and thus to be out. And out and about, we find, us, we find in us our resistive urges, our strangest courage, our alien languages, and we find one another there in that dark groping about for what is right in front of us urgently there and necessary, and so with new eyes urgently and necessarily here, of such necessity and urgency and caring for one another and our expressions, Conrad, Conrad writes in the introductory note to his chapbook of somatic poetry, somatic midge, get it? Not of his own deep, sustained, and beautiful capacities, neither writes of them in his poems nor in his other modes of loving a broken world, he writes not of the results nor of what he knows, but that care need be taken to locate what is there and so right here, to find that which is right here in front of us. <laughs> Quote, this is from Somatic Midge, I cannot stress enough how much this me mechanistic world, as it becomes more and more efficient, resulting in ever increasing brutality has required me to find my body, to find my planet, in order to find my poetry. If I am an extension of this, if I'm an extension of this world, then I am an extension of garbage, shit, pesticides, bombed and smoldering cities, microchips, cyber, and astral and biological pollution, but also the beauty of a patch of unspoiled sand, all that croaks from the mud, talons of the cliff that take, a, take rock and silt so seriously, flying over the spectacle, for a closer examination is nothing short of this necessary. The most idle looking pebble will suddenly match any hunger, any rage, suddenly, and will be realized at no other speed than suddenly. Welcome, C.A. Conrad. Is this working? Okay. I don't know. Can I give you the broken one? All right, thanks. <clears throat> no, I really, I don't know. No, I'm all right, thanks. I um, hate sitting through introductions, but that was lovely. I don't know what else to say. So. This is, uh, these are for me to take with me to read? This is, this is exciting. I can't wait to thank you for writing these. How to be rebellious. That's a good one. <laughs> I already like it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love Evergreen. It's an amazing place to come to. And I wanted to start off a little bit by talking about why I came to do, you can all hear me back there, right? Yeah, okay. Why I came to do this, the somatics. Um, I grew up in uh, a rural factory town in Pennsylvania. And my family, they're very creative people, but the factory literally just sucked the life out of them. And um, 
The factory extended itself outside the walls of the factory into their lives, and they just could not access that part of themselves at all. And um, for instance, my Aunt Darlene, well, we all, they all worked in a, a coffin factory when I was a child, and that was actually great in a, in a lot of ways because the coffin factory um, gave them the ability to be creative with the job. They were using tools, wood on wood, metal, I mean, glass. But then that factory went to Mexico after NAFTA pulled through the country and scraped everything clean. And um, did you have a question? No, you're just stretching. OK. <laughs> and um, so then they, they started working in different factories that were not so good for them. Like, for instance, a, um, my Aunt Darlene worked in a dental floss factory. Well, there's not too much room for creativity in a dental floss factory. And she retired nine months ago, and she died three months ago. And um, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So I wanted nothing to do with this. This is my point. I left to go to Philadelphia, and I felt pretty good. I, I got to Philadelphia in the mid-'80s, and it was a great time to be there. I felt really fantastic that I'd made my life what I wanted it to be. And I was writing. It was exactly what I wanted to do. But then in 2005, I went back out to where I grew up for a family reunion. And I was pretty depressed on the train ride home. My family is pretty depressing. And um, I had a realization on the train ride home that I had turned my poetry into an assembly line. I hadn't, it had sort of just crept into my praxis and bef but I figured it out on the train and it was horrifying to figure this out. It was a crisis. And I stopped writing for the better part of a month. I willed myself not there. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this factory. And then one day I woke up and I started making a list of all the problems with the factory, what it does to you, why it's destructive. And toward the top of that list was a f the phrase, inability to be present. And I realized at that point that I had something on my list that I could actually fix, that I could work on. Like That was the thing that terrified me the most about my family. They were never there when they were there. They were never present. So <clears throat> I started creating these rituals immediately. And for seven days, I ate a, a different color of food for a day. I went through the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, purple, white. And, um, and I found out right away that this, this was amazing, that I, could, that I could be inside these structures that I created, and it created an extreme present, where while I was doing them, there was absolutely no other place I could find myself I wasn't thinking about what I was doing later. I wasn't thinking about the past. I even have semantics built around that, where I go back to where I grew up, immerse myself in, in everything that I know about where I come from, but I'm forbidden to write a single line of memoir. It's all about being present, like where I am now. I was in Marfa, Texas uh, for a couple of months recently, and I was on a Lannan Fellowship, and there, I was walking down the street, and a car came by me very slowly. Why well, everything's very slow there, and um, but it was playing this song called "Band of Gold." I don't know if you don't need to know it. It's from the '70s. It's a pop song, and um, I mean, I I was born in '66, so this song is burned into my brain. And the great thing is that I got to stand there while this car parked in front of me and listen to the whole song for the first time and I don't know how long. But it wasn't until later that evening I <clears throat> that I realized if I had heard that song 10 years ago, I would have been hooked and dragged back into time and sentimental, nostalgic. But then I wasn't doing that. I was just standing there listening to the song as though I, was, I actually heard the lyrics, I think, for the first time. 
and um, I, the great thing is, well, I, have, I have a lot of Buddhist friends. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm nothing against Buddhists, but I'm not a Buddhist. And I have a lot of Buddhist friends who are saying, this is so Buddhist. And I was like, maybe Buddhism is this, you know, or whatever. Like, there's, there's doors and everything. My, I've been working on this now, well, next year it'll be 10 years. And I, I work on these every single day. I love working on them. I just can't imagine doing anything else. And it just excites me to wake up. Well, not entirely. We, there's a piece I'll talk about later that I do every morning wake up that that's, that's not too exciting, that somatic. But I have a book coming out in September. Oh, I have free broadsides for anybody who wants them, especially after so many of you gave me your work, which I'm excited to read. The new book is called Eco Deviance. Somatics for the Future Wilderness. And I wanted to, to thoroughly investigate as best I can what is going on right now with what we call the wilderness. Where I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, um, when I was a nine-year-old boy, I received my first gun. That's sort of what you get at nine. And... Um, and I spent a lot of time hunting. I've been a vegetarian for 26 years. Another, another thing my family thinks is nuts. But um, so I've been spending the last, well, especially last year when I was the 25th anniversary of being vegetarian. I spent the whole year writing about the animals I didn't kill and the ones that I did kill. And it's just, I can't even imagine shooting an animal now, but it was just so part of the culture. And I killed every kind of an animal you can imagine. And uh, the other boys loved to be with me because I was a really good shot. And I would bring home a pheasant. And it was sort of this adult thing. I don't know how to, it's very Lord of the Flies adult, but you know. And um, you know, like you're bringing home the food. And nobody questions you when you give some to your dog. I had a dog named Whisper, hunting dog. So, but I, I wanted to investigate this. And I was particularly interested in looking at what is considered wilderness. And the book does get into this quite a bit. I, I have a uh, very skeptical about what we call the wilderness in the lower 48 states. I, I think that it's pretty much non-existent, true wilderness. And um, for instance, I, I have a, the, the main piece in the book. It's called Eco Deviance, the, the resulting poem. And uh, what I did was I hung a flyer all over Philadelphia that said, silent meeting group, come to the book trader on 2nd and Market Street at this date, at this time. The only rule, no talking. So for an hour, this is investigating wilderness in, in, in one another. And, and uh, sort of an ecopoetics template, I would say. But because Ecopoetics is also a soundscape. It's all, you know, there's so many things we can incorporate into this idea of thinking. And I'll tell you, it's exciting to sit with people for an hour who are just there to stare at you. Oh, I was particularly thinking about places that where we go to be where we're quiet with strangers and it's perfectly acceptable and it's not odd, you know, like standing in line at the grocery store or whatever, you know, there are all kinds of places. But to get together to deliberately stare at one another for an hour is a whole other situation, considering the approximately 80% of our communication is nonverbal. My favorite person who showed up, 12 people showed up. A couple of these people tuned out after 10 minutes. 10 minutes was the, oh, 10 minutes was it. Some people were just like, no. I. Um, I can't handle any more than two minutes, and they, they're meditating with the mudras on the knees. I'm just checked out for 50 minutes. So the other people were into it a little too much, and particularly this one, like, young, like, she looks like she was 16, goth, with, like, her just incredible, go and snarled at us the whole time, just, like, looked at us like we were s ridiculous squares. <laughs> but the thing is, I was taking notes the whole time while looking at people and having people look at me about information that I was reading, had been reading, 
about the wilderness that we know of. First, you know, the Yellowstone National Park. Beautiful place. Yellowstone National Park, the deer and the wolves were wiped out and we put some back on purpose because we felt bad, which is what, which is what we do when we feel bad. We built a museum and, um, and Yellowstone National Park is a museum of fur, fangs, and hooves, pretty much. And it's a well-maintained safari. Um, in Idaho, this is, I read Fur, Fish, and Game as part of this project. It's quite gruesome to read. 42,255 hunting licenses for wolves to kill 255 wolves. I'll repeat that. 42,255 hunting licenses to kill 255 wolves. That's the reality we're living in. That's not wilderness. And this is not hunting back in the 70s when I was a kid with a, a, a simple Remington. This is high-powered rifles with call, you know, digital calling devices, tracking devices. It's crazy. And who's eating wolves? Nobody's eating wolves. So it's just a nightmare. But I also, to contradict myself, which I love to do, I said, okay, I'm saying that there is no wilderness. Now I want to do, I did another piece where I went to the business district in Philadelphia. And I was interviewing men, businessmen, in their $3,000 Teton Briani suits standing at the corner waiting for the light to change. And I would say, excuse me, sir. On a scale from one to five, one being thin and creamy, and five being cottage cheese, how would you rate your semen? <laughs> now, well, some people were mad about this. But the reason I asked is because I was looking for that feral interior, like looking for the wilderness like in the least likely place. And some men wanted to talk about it. I got. Um, grabbed and thrown against a light pole, whatever. It's for poetry. And um, I would like to read you a sample from this new book. That I loved doing this piece. And um, I guess I could read the poem that goes with it too. So this, this is a piece. This is the somatic ritual. And it's called Unknown Duration of Fear for Dawn Lundy Martin. Quote, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives, unquote, Annie Dillard. No matter how many human beings are born to overflow the land, we are still careful to touch. We are careful with the touching. On an eight hour flight, I took notes about a man pressed against my arm. There are so many men, and I almost know almost none of them. Even this one, whose forearm heat mixed with my forearm heat. When he slept, quietly snoring, dreaming, then jumping awake in his seat, looking to recognize me from the dream, from the airport, his face said, who is this? People he loved knew him in the past, the past being as much as an hour ago, and would know him again in the future, but in the present, he slouched against me, and no one he loved was there to see him breathing, the smaller breaths, a body taking down to rest. No matter how many human beings are born to push plants and animals off the planet, we only permit touching strangers in a few locations. Crowded subways, buses, airplanes. You do not touch a stranger at the checkout counter unless it's an accident, then you apologize. Sorry, say sorry. You cannot touch a stranger at the restaurant. You are not going to hold the stranger's hand while they cut meat because you will be called insane and asked to leave. If you refuse to leave, if you refuse to stop holding their hand, the police will be called. But if you know them a little, you can shake their hand, hello, and all is well. If you are close friends, you get a hug. If you are lovers, you can taste and smell one another, and this is a marvelous thing, and the world awaits. 
When he woke a little startled, I waved my turquoise glitter fingernails, glitter twinkling in lamplight, his eyes caught by glitter, smiling and nodding. What a nice smile a stranger can have. My notebook was small to conceal my notes for the poems, notes on the experience of pressing against a man for eight hours to never see him again. Will he remember the glitter? How could he possibly forget? There is no way to prevent the cost of living a day as the loss of that day, closer all the time to no more days. Death pisses me off and I want strangers to know this about me. I will make a sign, honk if death pisses you off, and they will honk even though we don't know one another. There's just not enough time to know us all. My goal is to relax with you, stranger, to not fear grabbing your hand at the doorway and introducing myself with a poem. And I really want to read the poem. So um, I wanted to talk about what I'm doing. So the eco-deviance has been and continues to be something that I am enjoying as well as learning so much about the world. As an artist, I'm more inclined to believe everything is collaboration. One of my heroes is the biologist Lim Margulis, who believed the neo-Darwinists were off target in their theories of evolution. She believed symbiosis, or interspecies cooperation, is the driving force behind new forms of life evolving. I want to just think about that all the time in my life in conjunction with Alice Notley's quote, poetry so common, hardly anyone can find it. I wanna bank myself against the ideas of both of these brilliant women. And collaboration is essential to under, I think that once we start to surrender to collaboration, our lives get so much easier. Um, because the fact is that we're already collaborating and in, in, in Bali, in their vocabulary in Bali, they don't have a word that's comparable to artist. There's nothing at all like that in their vocabulary because they assume everybody is. I'm a, if you were to ask them, I don't know, I haven't been to Bali, but I've seen documentaries and it's pretty beautiful. And it seems like everything is made beautifully because everybody considers the world in a different way than we do. And of course, when, if you, I mean, I, I haven't been to um, an exhibition of art from Bali, but I bet if there was one, we would call it folk art to make certain that it did not interfere with what's going up on the walls at the MoMA next week. Separate. It's just folk art after all. I believe collaboration is very important, and I love thinking about collaborating with other artists and also with other animals besides human animals and um, I have a piece I'm going to read about that. It's called Preternatural Conversations for Dana Ward. Every once in a while I think something about a stranger on the sidewalk and they dart a glance at me and I get it. I get it. We are one. Allow seven consecutive days for this exercise. Day one. Think about a woman you know. Think about experiences you've had with her. Think about conversations you've had. Think about the things she wears, eats, her way of walking, her laugh. Think about every detail you can imagine. See if she calls you or emails you. Take notes about this attempt at psychic connection. Day two, do everything you did in day one but for a man you know. Day three, go out to the streets and follow someone walking a dog. Look closely at the dog. Study the dog's movements. Whistle in your head, bark in your head. Imagine throwing a stick yelling, good dog, good dog. You are a very good dog. Does the dog respond to this? If so, how? Take notes. Days four, five, six, and seven are for strangers and cafes or restaurants are followed briefly on the sidewalk. Try to connect with two women and two men, complete strangers out in the world. Study them in cafes, museums, going up escalators, or maybe standing in line at the bank. Aim your attention at the clothing they wear, 
or the way they chew food. And Vision saying, hello, and tug their sleeve. Tug it with your mind, punctuated with putting an imaginary hand on their shoulder and saying, don't I know you? Imagine clapping and shouting, hey, 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 you. Did they look at you while you were walking behind them? Communicating beyond the auditory is our goal. What are the reactions? How do you feel about it? Take these seven days of notes and form your poems. Now, I do want to read a few of these poems because now I, I just want to briefly talk about the way I've been composing these poems because it's not the way I, I wrote prior to semantics. And um, the mode has changed entirely as well as the, the frame for how I'm seeing them. And uh, so I would take notes. And it's funny, you know, I did, I, I did this residency recently and there were novelists there and they're, they were great people, but they were always bragging about their word count at dinner. You know, it was kind of very interesting how many words they wrote, and I just don't really have anything to say about that. So it's just like numbers flying. But then they're like, well, how, you know, we see you out there, you're like writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And then they see the poem, and it's just like something like this, you know, these tiny little things. And um, that's just. It was just kind of odd, I think, to them. But they didn't under, they did, what they didn't understand was um, they were actually thinking about what they were writing. I wasn't. And I know that sounds strange to say that, but this, the somatics are all about trusting. After you're doing the experience, it's, a, it's an experiential practice. So as you're doing the experience, you then are infusing yourself with this experience, and then you're just trusting. And how does this work? Do people are saying, does that really work, the psychic? Well, you know, if you really want an answer, my a woman friend did contact me, the male friend did not, and the dog definitely looked at me. <laughs> and um, it was a cute little dog, and it was really into the poem. And, um, but I don't think about what these notes are. I just let them happen. And I write it. I write so fast that I can't keep up with any thoughts. And then I scrape it away, all this excrescence. And what I'm left with is the very barest essential portions of the experience. So I'm just going to read a few of these so you can get an example. One, I'm going in for a CAT scan. I mean an audition for an opera. Will it finally break into two paths? The suffering one is tiresome. Every gentle piece of marble in the sun was once beaten into shape. This doesn't work with people. Take many deep breaths. Maybe breathing can help. Jesus didn't need balance. He had nails. There's nothing mean about it. It's just a fact. Okay. Three. And I didn't do it anyway, so. I make a pie in my own image. Doorknob carried in bag for months. Open, open, opening not a single thing. But when public toilet seat is warm from previous ass, do you become comforted or leap off in fear? Love is the function of time, is the discovery. This dream pays for its space in my heart. Ed Dorn says faggots should drink directly from the sewer. I want to dress special for this. Finger wilderness in his beard. IV drip of Sphinx's blood. What camouflage will you wear to hide in the gingerbread house, he asks. None. I want a witch to find me, eat me. I prefer a song where I am fed. Oh, Ed, if you can't handle me calling you my sister, I don't need a brother. If I had been there when they invented the word chair, things would be different, would sound better. Look at this amazing structure over there, you know what they look like. I lost my place. I shouldn't have looked away. 
and now I can't find it. I'm just, I don't know. You know when you do that? No, I don't know. Things would sound better. Okay. Look at this amazing <laughs> structure. <laughs> Holding our bodies in place to write, to quarrel with ourselves and others, to eat and sing, to launch forth new ideas, to comfort the sphincter. Chair is a ridiculous word, monosyllabic nonsense. I love chairs, but remain annoyed by their name, living in the post-vocabulary chosen without imagination. Chair, 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 chair. Nothing less than seven syllables will do. <laughs> Collaboration with people who don't know you're collaborating with is what I've been talking about. But I'd also want to say, you know, the traditional way of poets collaborating with painters, for instance, let's just choose painters, has always bored me to tears. You know, like if the painter paints a painting and says, would you like to write a poem about my painting? I'm like, well, no, sir, I wouldn't actually. <laughs> However, I would like to collaborate with you. This actually happened, an artist. I won't mention his name since I've just said this terrible thing. At him. But I, he said, well, what do you want to do? What do you mean, Claude? This is how I collaborate with poets. I was like, well, not this one. I said, I want this to be 50-50. I want us to both create a ritual together. You create half of it, I create half of it. We put it together. So the collaboration is the experience. And then we do the ritual. I write a poem, you paint a painting, and it's perfect. And that's what I do. I've been working with dancers and I've been working with musicians. And I recently, this was very exciting. I am uh, a huge fan of the painter Ishio Wang. And Ishio uh, was in Marfa while I was there. And I walked into her studio at Marfa Book Company. She was in the back, her, the studio was in the back of Marfa Book Company and her paintings just terrify me. And um, it's sort of like Rilke's Duino Elegy is about angels scaring the hell out of you and like, what are you gonna do when you see this angel and you just wanna die? And, um, and I was very quiet, I was freaked out by her pains because they're so intense, they're so amazing. And she got really mad, she put her hand on her, she's like, are you gonna say something or what? You know? And I said, I, I said, well, they're like murder prevention. And she's like, what does that mean? I said, well, I don't feel like murdering anybody, but I think if somebody did feel like somebody murdering somebody, you should just bring them in here immediately <laughs> because it changes you c as soon as you walk in the room. So, and then we became friends and uh, we hung out every evening and went to the Lost Horse Saloon and it's watched the Marfa Lights. But she, uh, I was in the Bay Area recently and she lives in Berkeley and she said, uh, these paintings that she painted in Marfa that I watched her paint, 22 paintings, they were going in a gallery in San Francisco and uh, the show's now up presently and she said, the gallerists want me to paint, title these paintings and I don't know what to do. I want you to come and title the paintings. And I said, okay, but we're gonna do it as a somatic ritual, we're gonna do, we're gonna, but we're gonna do it together. And so we spent nine hours, who knew it was gonna take that long? But it took nine hours. I brought tarot cards and herbs and crystals. And um, I've been doing a lot of uh, research on piezoelectricity, the quartz crystal technology. And um, why not? They're there and they can help us. And so we, I would do these experiments with each painting. She would bring a painting out and prop them up on rocks in her living room. And um, we would have, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a, there's a, there's a crystal called quartz, um, cactus quartz. It's also called spirit quartz, some people call it that. And it's, and it's the shaft is what you normally would think of like, the, like a crystal formation, but then there are little crystals all around it, and that's the point of which it becomes a collaborative stone. So there are all these points on it. This is the stone of collaboration which I love to use because I love collaboration. Or I love admitting that I'm collaborating. I like to put it that way, because you're ma collaborating anyway. And um, so I would read tarot cards to the paintings. I know it sounds crazy, but whatever. We got titles. And then I would sit down and hammer out text, and then I would go through the, um, 
I would, I would find a title. And the funny thing was, I didn't, I didn't know which painting in front of me was painted when or why or how. Like, I didn't know the exegesis. Because the thing is, Ishu and I would hang, she, would, she and I would hang out in the evening, and we were busy all day long working on what we were there to work on. So I didn't get to see what was going on, but it always corresponded with what was going on. And it was just great and uh, a great experience. I loved it. So I just want to read a few of these titles. Writing the letter of your life in the clearing. Flying over the transmutation of the quiet. Stethoscope to the petroglyph. The horns in the distance when we leave for the mountains. Thinking with a longbow. Bending the muscle of light. Calling across the watermelon field for you. And she, let, she titled the show Calling Across the Watermelon Field for You. And if you want to know more about that, just let me know. Her paint, you really have to see these paintings. In fact, if you get a broadside, you don't even have to ask me. There's my website's down here, and you just find the somatic website, and you'll see pictures of the two of us with Palo Santo ashes on our forehead and hanging out with her paintings. But I also like, so I, I, sh I just shared the piece about working with the dog. And I, and I did another piece with a pigeon, but I'd like to read that. And then I want to read one more piece, and then I'd like to hear from you questions. Do you have a Painted Pigeon Project for Candace Lynn. Candace Lynn is another artist uh, I work with. She's in Los Angeles. Incredible artist. I don't know if you're familiar with her work or not, but it's mind-blowing. And I love Candace. I, uh, I would, was doing a, a performance at Machine Project. I wrote this book called The Book of Frank. And they wanted me there to read the whole book from beginning to end, which just sounded insane. And I was sitting there prepping for it. And she walked in. I was like, oh my god, that's Candace Lynn. And she says, I have a present for you. I was like, you, I don't even know you knew me. Like, how, you know, and she puts the scroll down. And I un open the scroll, and it's a painting she did of, of me looking like some kind of crazy witch or something, <laughs> inserting a human femur bone into her vagina. And I said, thank you, Candace. <laughs> it's really sweet of you. I don't know what to say. But anyway, we did a collaboration, um, a somatic collaboration where she was creating a whole amazing, you have to check out, it's, her last name is L-I-N, Candace Lynn. You have to go to her website. There's puppets she makes in these landscapes. They're just not like anything you've ever seen. Find a photograph of a bird far from where you live. I received a photo of a beautiful, truly extraordinary pigeon who lives near the, the Rialto Bridge in Venice. She has turquoise, chartreuse, and even shades of dark green and blue painted with food coloring by artists. Print the photo and flutter it above your head. Hold it to the trees, rocks, ledges, imagining, imagining, imagining. I painted my hand colors of the Venetian beauty, cooing when hands snuggled inside a pocket. I took notes while eating seeds offered from my pigeon hand. Pigeon hand is not a condition any more than artist art is a condition. Save hair from your brush and roll it into a nice soft ball. Then wash it. Insert a few seeds of flax, pumpkin, and caraway, something delicious. Pour more seeds on the ground, hair tucked in the center. Wait and watch. Soon enough, a bird will carry it off to cushion their nest. Try to be patient and watch for them, to see them. Write down exactly what they looked like, where they flew off to, and keep that writing on you at all times. Take it out of your pocket and read it. Read it before going off to sleep at night. Dream of the nest by thinking about these small feathered creatures sleeping on your hair, and touch your hair while falling off to sleep. You and the birds sleeping and dreaming together. Wake 
and write as fast as you can without thinking about dreams or peeing or eating. Wake and write, wake and write. The notes become the poem. I'm not gonna read that poem. So that's another collaborative piece. Another collaborative piece I did, I went to Occupy Philadelphia. I went to Occupy Wall Street six different times and um, it was, I just, I became addicted to it. I live in, I was in Philadelphia. So two of the times out of those six, I was already in New York for some other reason. But four of those times, I just woke up one these mornings and just said, I gotta get to Occupy Wall Street. This is bullshit, what am I doing in bed? And I would get up there and, you know, <clears throat> This one residency, I'm not gonna mention it because I don't wanna offend anybody, but I was at this artist residency with um, some obviously artists and we're having dinner and you know some of them were kind of grumpy and um, I wasn't. I was so excited to be there. And, uh, but one evening they started being grumpy about these, these, these kids today with their MFAs in art and blah, 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 blah. And that was when I just said, listen, I've been tolerating your grumpiness, but you are not gonna talk like this about young people getting degrees in art or creative writing because 75 to 80% of everybody I met at Occupy Wall Street was an art student, a creative writing student. This is where the creativity is going. This is, this is about collaboration on a much bigger scale. And I feel like I've been waiting my whole life to be part of something where you, there are no leaders. It was completely horizontal, that political structure. Everybody made the decisions together and it worked. You know, people got pepper sprayed, whatever. That's a whole other story. I'm talking about the structure within what was going on Occupy Wall Street, not the outer structure that was kind of terrifying and ugly. Yeah, so I went to Occupy Philly because I, have, I had real issues with Occupy Philadelphia. Occupy Wall Street, I was always saying to these, there were these pugilant young men who were bossy and always telling everybody, I'd be like, dude, you need to go to New York and see how it's working up there because there is nobody like you up there telling us what to do. You're irritating. <laughs> and, um, but I went online to uh, learn how to catheterize myself and I wanted to do this whole thing about gays in the military, which this was, the repeal was coming up. I was on several, I was on several dis, um, panel discussions because it was about the only faggot they could find who was willing to get up there and say they were opposed to the repeal of Don't Answer, Don't Tell because I'm opposed to war. And people were screaming at me from the audience, screaming at me, they were so angry. Um, who cares? I survived. The thing is, I wanted to spend a day it was in pain, it was painful, but I did it anyway. And uh, so the notes from this poem, and I'm collaborating with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine wonderful people in the audience here who um, at the beginning when I would ask people to please give me a statement about war. So they're all on here and I'm gonna, I'm weaving these statements from some of you in the audience uh, throughout this poem. The poem is titled, It's Too Late for Careful. Melting glaciers frighten me when appearing on my street as downpours. Caitlin Betty says war is inevitable. A feeling I send ahead of myself to one day walk inside. Allison Cuthbertson says war is death. People sleep while I inspect their flowers. Not as weird as you think. Kelsey Delagrange says, war is ugly. I dreamt gays were allowed in the military. Isn't it great, everyone said? What a nightmare, I said. Killing babies is less threatening with a politically correct militia. Vices for the vice box. For wards of the forward state who like different things to kill alike. Blaine Edwig says, war is bullshit. We cannot occupy Wall Street, but we can occupy Kabul. Massage our anger with a heart chakra green, blessings soaked into bed sheets. There is a way of looking into time for a poem. Send it into the future. 
Your footprint has grown small. What is wrong with your footing? Jesse Logan says, war never changes. What kind of an American are you? Just buy it or steal it, but shut up. This poem is terrific for the economy. The rich have always tasted like chicken. I'm not a cannibal because they're not my kind. <laughs> D. Del 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 Delicio says, war is perplexing, yet complex and simple at the same time. We cannot occupy Philadelphia, but we can occupy Baghdad. We're the kind of poets Plato exiled from the city limits. Fuck Plato, that paranoid faggot. Don't ask, don't tell. How about don't kill and say whatever you want? For instance, when I adopt a cat, I will name him Genet. Genet! Genet! I practice calling Genet into my life. <laughs> Devin Fankhauser says war is fucked up. When you purchase a car, the factory's pollution is 100% free. It's never easy waking to this. Bacteria and light, mucus and bone, a legacy of stardust. It is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit inside all humans, the freshly murdered, their murderers, and the rest of us between. Lindsay Lesser says, war is a violent external stimuli that negatively affects human emotions on a global scale. My father lived to see the fast forward to the cum shot, technology's authentic application. Valencia Gano says, Boy George says, war, war is stupid. We cannot occupy Oakland, but the ghosts will occupy us. Miranda Millis says, crow and fragility. I will stay and watch our phoenix rise. I believe in us. That's the piece. Thank you for helping me write it. I wanted to put them in my hair because for since the third anniversary of the invasion of Baghdad, I've been writing a very long poem every single morning. I stopped cutting my hair that morning, and um, it just, you know, all the years friends and I had spent thinking that we were going to stop the war with our s protest. Well, a joke. But I didn't want to be a, an American who was forgetting that we're a nation at war, so I wanted something that was always going to remind me every morning and... So I stop cutting my hair, but I, what I, when I wake up, I look at the latest body counts in, in Baghdad, well, in Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm still, I'm still looking at our, Iraq. I don't care what anybody says in Washington. And um, Yemen, Pakistan, and then I take the body count and I measure my inches of hair by how many people are dead, and then I write. It's just endless and terrible. But I would like to ask if you have any questions, thank you again for having me. Thank you, Miranda, David, <laughs> everything. Yeah. Does anybody have any question? Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank you. I, I like your approach to language, and I, in that poem, you said, how about don't kill and say whatever you want? Thank you. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you, why do you write? Why I write? Are you compelled? Do you ever have to make yourself do it? Or is it just something that's always present for you? <clears throat> well, when I was a child, I, uh, my mother, I'll try to be brief with this, sorry. I'm going to be brief with this. My mother, um, she was a bit of a miscreant. She was arrested a lot by the police, and she had a hard time finding work. So at the age of eight, she put me to work selling uh, bouquets of cut flowers along the highway. And um, there was nothing around. It was 
just completely desolate, except it was at the mouth of the Pennsylvania Turnpike in Quakertown. So I was sit, forced to sit there every Friday afternoon after school till dusk, Saturday from early in the morning till dusk, and Sunday from early morning till like three or four in the afternoon. That's a lot of isolation for an eight-year-old. And, um, but it, it turned me into a reader, and nobody in my family or in the town even reads. There's just, it's, they're allergic to it. And um, so it became, I became a reader, and through that forced isolation, and through that also a writer. That's, that's I've just, I've, it's from formative experiences, I guess is the best way to answer. Hi. Um, this, is, this is great. Um, I'm Katie Barber, children, but I think that um, she'll have to try really hard to make me laugh. It's a great slap of medicine. Um, <laughs> Margaret Cho, yeah, she's really amazing. Margaret Cho and I are um, part of this fundraiser right now. To um, You're all familiar with Radar, Sister Spit, the amazing Sister Spit, Michelle T. Michelle T invited some of us to write in, an, in a moleskin notebook for a month, and um, then they're going to auction off the notebooks. So Margaret Cho's doing that, and I, I can't believe I'm doing anything with Margaret Cho. It's very exciting be doing something with Margaret Cho. And Annie Sprinkle, yeah, so yeah. You should ask her about it tonight. If you have an opportunity, you may not have an opportunity to be like, hey, Margaret. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, yeah. um, I do have a question. Um, you were talking about how your poetry has become like a um, assembly line. Yeah. I guess I was wondering, like, did you, did you feel that something was wrong with it while you were creating that poetry that you kind of saw? Is it something like before, or was it? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to say more about what that means. Um, Thank you. Did everybody hear the question? Well, I think I needed to, it was going back to see my family when I, that I realized that it was happening. It, it really took, it, it, I needed that perspective. And um, so the question is, was it a pro why was it a problem? Is that the question? I'm trying to. I mean, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, so you've been writing poetry and you came to the conclusion that that poetry had been kind of an assembly line. Do you feel that that, that it was problematic while you were writing that poetry? Um, and yeah, and also, like, what, what was problematic about it? What was the assembly line about it? Just, right. Like, anything you have to say about it? Well, you know what? The best way to answer you is to, so this is a map that I drew of an ant. You know, do you mind if I read you one more piece? Because this is the answer to your question. Um, I didn't plan on reading it, so it'll just take me a second. I'm just gonna do this thing that annoys me when other people do it. Um, <laughs> and it's not here, so never mind. But, um, <laughs> so what I did was, I was out in the Chihuahuan Desert and I followed an ant. And I drew um, the map of the ant and then I um, retraced the map on myself and, um, and then I also took to cook spaghetti, which is why there's these weird s stains on the paper, and put it and made it in the shape of the map. It's a root more than a map, but it's, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and then when it dried, I took it back to the nest and crumbled it up around them, and I said, I want, it's nice of you to give me this map, but I don't want it. And um, I'm, I'm, terrified by ants because of coming from a factory, fa a family who works in factories. Ants disturb me. Um, they're great, I love them, they're beautiful, but oh God, I'm so glad I'm not an ant. I mean, you're born to work. Well, I don't know why, you know what I mean? Like you're just, you're working, you're bringing your little seeds back and you're stacking them up and then uh, a tarantula or a bird will eat you and no one will even notice you're gone. They just keep pumping out more of you. It's horrible. So that was, I was, and it was the whole thing about the factory, and I mentioned my family, and I mentioned in the somatic, when my Nana Conrad died, she died on a Monday, they put her body on ice and waited for Saturday so nobody would have to miss work. I mean, that's pretty ridiculous. You can't even die. 
Well, my Aunt Darlene, who died, um, she drank herself to death. I mean, it wasn't like she just had a heart attack enjoying her retirement. She was not enjoying herself. And I, you know, the thing is, when you're working that many hours of your life every day, every week, every month and year, watching this machine with this dental floss or, you know, cough drop factories, cardboard box factories. My family, they've worked in all kinds of factories. The coffin factory was so much better because they could be creative and like my uncles would get drunk at picnics and they'd pull out Polaroids. They're like, look at this great coffin I made the other day. See those little roses on there? That's new. I never did that before and I had to get this heating element. And like, you know, there was this, it was beautiful. But I also hated that because, you know, my dad would lecture me when I was like 16, you're gonna work in the coffin factory this summer. I was like, no, I'm not. I am not stepping foot in there, except on Halloween when the kids are allowed in. And, um, <laughs> um, I mean, I did not want to have anything to do with creativity being put into a box that people were just going to enjoy. They weren't enjoying it. There's no enjoyment. You're at a funeral. And then it's put in the ground and covered up. Nobody cares about that. But, you know, they were proud of these things anyway. They had their Polaroids, and they would get drunk, and you would see them. And, um, but yeah, I didn't want anything to do with that. So when I discovered that I was doing it on a, a certain level, you know, like an assembly line, I had it all. So like, this is where the poems go that are in this stage, and here's a folder, and here's the tabs. And I really do believe that efficiency breeds brutality. And I just want nothing to do with that. I wanted to be free from that. I mean, we're just here for a while, and then we die. So we might as well do what we want to do if we can, right? Sydney, anybody else have a question? How do you collaborate with dancers? Uh, in several ways, I've collaborated with dancers. I love it when dancers show up to my workshops. And um, there were three dancers who didn't even know one another who showed up to a workshop. And that was kind of fun because they were being very competitive and it was funny watching. But um, while we were writing notes for poems, they were working out dance moves around us, which really uh, was a whole collaboration as well as uh, inside the workshop because their movements were feeding what we were doing and I hope vice versa. And um, they said, because I asked, I said, well, is our writing helping you? And they're like, oh yes, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, they, they were just being nice. <clears throat> well, I wrote this piece. Well, this is not so much a collaboration as um, but I wrote this piece that's in my book, A Beautiful Marsupial Afternoon, where you keep track all day long of when you're being dishonest, and you clench your toes. And at the end of the day, you soak your toes, and you're supposed to think about what's wrong with this toe-clenching situation. And, um, <laughs> and this amazing dancer named Ellie Guderville from Stone Depot Dance Troupe, she choreographed a whole piece around that where she went, and I was like, I can't wait to see what she's doing. What is she doing? And she did this bizarre dance where she was clenching her toes and her buttocks and everything, and she would just flip around, and it was the most extraordinary experience watching her interpretation of the actual ritual. But I have also collaborated with other dancers where we, we it's just like I was saying, we both we set up these parameters if you want to call them that, if you call it an exercise, I like I prefer calling them rituals at this point. And um, yeah, the the poet Laura Riding has this whole wonderful idea about what ritual is in poetry that I've always I think she's brilliant. But anyway, um, yeah, literally they would choreograph a dance while I was writing a poem, and yeah, it's pretty simple. And you can collaborate with everybody and anybody at any time. That's so great. So you would just be writing silently while they move? Oh, not so silently. For instance, okay, and that actually, yeah, it was like whistling. and Like I just did this piece in LA where I was um, a machine project. I was teaching uh, some classes at CalArts in Pomona, but when, I, but when I came back, I wanted to, I was investigating the word drone. 
drones. I'm reading about drones every morning with this, you know, this war hair piece. And um, I just, I'm so bugged by that word, drone. I'm just like, I mean, you know, you, you can pretty easily see where it first comes from, but I want to know why DC has spent so much time and energy selling this to us the way that they have. And I'm completely convinced that the long O and the, the cut N in there is very similar and deliberately so, similar to Ohm. And we all know, in fact, I have a quote in here from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, there is harmony, peace, and bliss in this simple but deeply philosophical sound. So the thing is, Om calms the body, centers us, it, it affects us, the sound affects us, and in a way that is extraordinary. And so what I did was, I sat in Machine Project with my feet flat and started chanting drone over and over, like I, was chant like I would chant Om. And the very same things happen to my body and my mind that happen if you chant Om. Exact same things. And then I was like, this is so disturbing. So then I went down to the corner. It was a busy corner at Sunset Boulevard in Alvarado. And I just started interviewing everybody on the corner like, excuse me, would you please join me in calling drones what they really are? flying killer robots. And people were like, oh. And you know, we'd have these conversations about drones and about, well, you can imagine. But then I would convince some of them to chant drone with me, and they were just as amazed as I was with how you feel after doing it for about five minutes. So then I went to Echo Park, and I had a recording uh, that I downloaded from the internet of the military operation called Pillar of Cloud. It was an Israeli and American military operation that happened a couple years ago in Gaza. And they filled the sky with drones, a whole fleet of them, for, for three days, nonstop. So there's a recording, and it's actually, there's video for it too, it's on YouTube. and. Um, the, it's, just a, it's just footage of the sky. You don't see the drones, but you hear them very clearly, and you hear the missiles, and then the explosion, the, the resulting explosion. So what I did was I got a, a red Sharpie pen, and I made a red target on my left hand. My left hand, because I'm right-handed. So my right hand is the side of my body that sends energy out, and then my, my left is receptive. So I had the target on my hand, and I was listening to this as loud as I could. I did this in Echo Park because I came up with the idea in Texas, but I was like, if I'm sitting around screaming while writing in public and here, people are going to not, they're going to call the police. So I waited till I was in Echo Park because I thought, you know, there are people always screaming around there, and nobody <laughs> seems to care. So. And I did, I sat by the water and I would listen to the recording and whenever an ex a missile would go off and an, as soon as I would hear an explosion, I would scream as loud as I could into the target while writing. And the weird thing about the notes for this is that when I'm chanting drone, especially with people, the notes are just so rich with this idea of interspecies cooperation, I'm getting back into Lynn Margulis, just this whole other idea of connecting with the world in a beautiful way. But as soon as I'm screaming into my hand, the notes are just hellish. It's just, it's upsetting, and so I have no idea how that poem's eventually gonna wind up, but it has nothing to do with your question about dancers, sorry. <laughs> I don't even know where that, how that wound up there, I don't know. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Well, that's a good question, thank you. I feel like there are so many instances where we have no choice, no option 
to not be present. I mean, there, there's some, you're planning a trip. You've got to think in the future. What am I going to do? I mean, there's so many times in our lives where we have to think about the future or the past that um, I'm not really worried. And I feel like that. I'll get plenty of that. You know what I mean? But to create a space where I'm only going to be present is um, it's becoming essential to me. Like, I can't imagine not doing this at this point. I mean, I have a notebook, a running notebook of ideas for future somatics and that include, um, you know, what if I'm diagnosed with cancer? How to write on chemotherapy? Like, whatever. You're, we're all going to die, so get, get ready because nobody told you, sorry, <laughs> to warn you about this at this hour. But, um... Yeah, just getting ready. And I also have a whole running list of somatics that are impossible. Like I'm obsessed with the space station. You know, I'm like, how can I get there to do these things? <laughs> and it's not gonna happen. They're not gonna allow, they're not gonna let me. <laughs> I'm not in good shape. I think you have to be in better shape than I am. They'll, you know, they're not gonna let me up there. But I love thinking about it and uh, that's, and see, the thing is, that's not really being present because I'm thinking about future somatics. So, you know, there you go. Does that answer your question? <laughs> oh, didn't I didn't answer your question? <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> oh. Hi, um, my question kind of goes with that question. I'm a little nervous that I don't have it sorted out, but I'm that's gonna, right. I'm gonna try. Um, so I, I, I do dance and I do writing, and. How I got, the reason why I got started is because I wanted to feel like I was inside of my body again. And um, I've been thinking a lot about dissociation. And I was reading recently this article about um, the phenomenology of the ghost and like revision and like literature and thinking about like the revision or the double or something. But it was talking about ghosts as being like when you see a ghost, there's a disassociation between the meaning of what's happening in the event. Or like between what we can identify and what we can't read that's going on. And I, I'm really curious thinking about the idea of like a useful ghost or like a time when that dissociation is productive and times in my life when dissociating was like made for my survival, you know? So I, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm coming, like since coming into these practices and being able to get better into my body, I'm now thinking more playfully about um, useful dissociations in, in my work and in creative practice. And I was wondering if, if you'd want to talk to me about that too or something. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I'm glad you said all of this. And, um, <clears throat> and I love that you're a dancer who's writing. And um, I, I, I think of friends of mine in New York with movement research. They're all dancers and poets, and which is great. And um, Marissa Pearl and these people, and Miguel Gutierrez, you're familiar with him? Miguel Gutierrez, uh, he and I just did a collaboration and uh, for um, Vox Populi, and he's a wild dancer. I think you'd really love Miguel, but he's also an incredible poet. And um, dissociation. Can I, can, I, can I talk about one of my favorite dancers and way of talking about this? Are you familiar with the dancer Mary Wigman? She was a student of Le Bon's in the 20s. And she was, there's just, I just can't even tell you how much her witch, it's called witch dance, it means to me. And um, so I just did this big piece of Marfa, Texas called, um, Marfa Poetry Machine and 36 Things, where I did 36 things a day for 36 days. Like taking the movie Giant, you know, with Rock Hudson, James Dean, and Elizabeth Taylor, and breaking it into 36 components, the 36 parts. So it's five minutes and 23 seconds a day I would watch of that. For instance, one of the 36 things. One of those things was to take Mary Wigman's Witch Dance, <clears throat> which uh, she first performed in 1922, I believe, and use it like a Jane Fonda workout video. And just 
do it with her. She's on the floor. Do you, this, you have to see this to believe it. And she's stomping her feet in a circle. But the thing is that that's, I'm going to this dissociation part. Um, am I going on too long? Is this pushing? Okay, good. And I forget when it's over. I don't know. Oh, great. Okay, good. So there's an interview with Mary Rigman where she talks about being a young woman having a nervous breakdown. And she went to her, um, back to her parents' house and stayed in the guest room. And they, were, they didn't really seem to know what to do. And they were just doing the best they could. To, and she said she was sitting on the floor and just started moving her body. And this is where the dance comes from. And I believe that Mary Wigman may be the first modern dancer to deliberately use dance as a form of trauma release. Because the muscles she's exercising when you see this are very much in line with um, TRE, trauma release exercises, you're familiar with these? And um, I think that dance is great for changing your life and to, to be the person you want to be. And I think well, like that's what she did and that's what she found out. And it's, you, ha you have to, and doing it with her is so much fun. Yeah. I don't know if I really <laughs> answered your question. Sorry about it. Um, so I have a question about species. Um, so responding to like the importance of interspecies collaboration in your work, um, I guess I'm curious as to what you're thinking about species are <coughs> and is and, and how that organization of life operates. And I'm, I'm especially asking this question after hearing your anecdote about folk art. Um, about what? About folk art. Oh, folk art. And how like um, that uh, like discrete category in art can like disarm the potency involved in creative production and like so organization in the natural the natural world. What that means to you? I want to go back to Lynn Margulis because um, her research was so essential for breaking the breaking down the walls that were around. She, she sort of flies in the face of the neo-Darwinists, for instance, you know. I mean, they're busy saying everything's a war, you know, like everything's their survival of the fittest. And she's saying, ah, actually, it's more about cooperation. And she's the one who did this, the study on the bacteria in our bodies and how we, we need the bacteria in our bodies as much as the bacteria in our bodies need us. And begins from there, and then she traces it back to find out that our ancestors are bacteria. The bacteria have created everything. And, but it was about communities of bacteria that started to form other life forms. So, that, so the, very, the very beginning of life is all about collaboration and building new forms. So it's just like the, using OM. OM, there are a lot of other things about OM. Did I have that quote? Let's see. No, it's about a Brahmin priest. No, but the but Om is also supposed to. Uh, I'm sorry. It's supposed nothing wrong with the Brahmin priest. I'm just saying that it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, but chanting Om is also supposed to get you in touch with this molecular structure of your most basic self, which to me is like just going back to the cells and. I have a whole piece with an MRI machine where, because uh, the MRI machine, I love MRI machines. I mean, you don't really want to have to get it because it's usually not a good idea, you know, but I think they're great because it's a giant magnet and you're in there and all your water molecules face one direction so they can get this image. And, and if you drink a lot of water right away when you come out, you feel like a million bucks. Well, unless you're already in pain and you're in there with pain, but you know, never mind. I'm sorry. But the thing is about the MRI machine <clears throat> is that it, it takes your cells and moves the water molecule in one direction. And it really gets you feeling about just how much water we are and how much that water, since we're <laughs> composed of water, and then further researching how water is affected by sound and 
a collaboration with the composer Missy Mazzulli. She's got a band called um, Victoire. Her, their city is called Cathedral City. It's great. And they have an homage to Arthur Russell and a bunch of other things. I, I took a piece of fruit and would, and uh, this is like an editing project, and I'd put the piece of fruit on the floor with my laptop and play one track from Cathedral to City as loud as I could and cover the basket, cover them with a basket and blankets and pillows, and then eat the fruit very quickly because I'm infusing the water molecules with the sound of Missy's music, and I'm like eating Missy's music, and um, nothing wrong with that, and. Um, <laughs> I'm not answering your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Species, I don't know. I really, I, um, Valencia Gano and I were talking, Valencia, what is this field again you were talking about? The morphic, the morphic field. This connect, this, it's interspecies connection. And we were trying, and I was telling you, when you were telling me about this, and I told you about the, a documentary that I saw from England about dogs, where they um, had cameras on dogs and the family households, and the families would leave, about 12 families, they would leave at different times, random times. And f in every case, 15 minutes before the family came driving back, the dog would walk over by the door and, and sit there. The dog just knew, just these connections that we have. So I was very excited, and that's why I was out walking around talking to dogs without talking. I don't know, what's to do? There might be time for one more. Um, okay, I'm generally very wrong with that question, so I'm just going to give you two words and I want you to do stuff with them. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, semantics and post criticism. Go. Post criticism? Okay. I, don't, I don't even know if that exists. I don't know. Maybe it should. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> wow. I'd rather talk about some post words that annoy me. Like the word post, the term post identity politics annoys me. You know, because it assumes, the term assumes that it's just, you know, oh, no, these people were actually busy making room for everybody to be included in the world, uh, civil rights of, of whatever we call it. But no, no, post identity politics is assuming that it's just politics. It's the filth of conspiracy of politics, not about being a human being wanting to live on this earth with others. Post-criticism, I don't think that's ever going to exist. Um, somatics, well the word soma is inside the word somatic. The word soma is an Indo-Persian word that um, is in the Rig Vedas, which is the very first book ever written, and it's about, well it was an actual substance that you would consume to be in touch with the spirit within, but I use soma as a noun and a verb, and it's a seeking as well as the thing you use to seek. And somatic is Greek for the flesh and the body cavity, the nervous system. So I love the fact that the word for the, the soma, the soul, or the seeking of the soul is inside the word for the flesh. It's just like staring at us right there. And the word for the soul is four letters, and then you just add T-I-C at the end, tick. Tick's a terrible thing. You know what I mean? Ticks, they bite you and you get diseases. And there's a tick at the end of Soma. There you go. And then it's human being, human being. It's just awful. <laughs> and beautiful. Well, thank you so much. I have free broadsides for anybody who wants them. <laughs> <laughs>